Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. To God be the glory for this day, for this is a day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Minister Clarissa Tinsley. I bring you greetings on behalf of Pastor Gilbert, Piney Hill Baptist Church, and On the Wall Ministries. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to enter into our Sunday school hour this morning. Let us pray. Holy Father, in the name of Jesus, we worship you, magnify you, and adore you. We thank you, Lord God, that this day your mercies are brand new unto us. Father God, we thank you for our opportunity to enter into your word and, and to study your word, to study to show ourselves approved unto you, workers that need not to be ashamed. We pray, Father God, asking you to forgive us for how we've fallen short of your glory in the past week. Lord, as we go forth in the week to come, help us to be a blessing and an encouragement to somebody else. Now, Father, we thank you for this time. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Help us to hear what thus saith the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we welcome you this morning to the Sunday School Study of Genesis chapter 42 verses 6 through 25. Our lesson is taught from the standard lesson commentary. The title of today's lesson is Victorious Love. As we consider the story of Joseph this morning and Victorious Love, I believe we will come to several conclusions of Victorious Love. Think on this with me for a moment. Victorious Love doesn't come easy. Victorious love tests us. Victorious love humbles us. Victorious love is full of grace and mercy. Victorious love is sacrificial. Victorious love responds in wisdom. Victorious love is found in the fear and love of God. Consider the life tapestry the weaving of family relationship and life experiences of Joseph that eventually gives us this display of his victorious love. Joseph, a favored child, a dreamer, possibly a bit braggadocious. His brothers might say he was a tattletale. His brothers were not only jealous of him, but they hated him, the scriptures say. He was falsely accused, sold as a slave, a prisoner, even forgotten, and maybe sometime even felt forsaken. But even with this tapestry of life, he can still come forth with victorious love. I submit to you this morning, the reason Joseph was able to have and give victorious love was because of four words in verse 18, and we'll get to that later. So let's read our lesson this morning. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but he made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, from the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, This is that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved whether there be any truth in you, or else 
by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together into war three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn and famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore in this is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against this child, and you would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. So let's look at the lesson context this morning. When the Egyptians began to feel the effect of the predicted famine from lesson two, they cried out to Pharaoh for relief. Pharaoh sent them to Joseph, whom he had appointed to prepare Egypt for the years of famine. However, Egypt was not the only land affected by this great famine. Many countries were affected, including the homeland of Joseph. So Jacob instructed 10 of his sons, Joseph's half-brothers, to go to Egypt to purchase food. He sent all of his sons except the youngest, Benjamin, who was Joseph's whole brother by the favored wife, Rachel. So let's look at verse, verses 6, 7, and 8. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land and Joseph's brethren, and bowed themselves, and, jo and Joseph's brethren came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. Joseph had been appointed as governor and second in command after his proposal for how to prepare Egypt for the coming years of famine, which was made known by Joseph, Joseph's interpretation of the king's dreams. The task of preparation was complete. The famine was upon them. Now it was time for distribution. So Joseph's brothers came and appropriately bowed themselves before him as an Egyptian noble. If only they knew whom they were bowing to at this time. Here Joseph is some 20 years later and 20 years older and his brothers are bowed before him. Can you imagine the childhood flashbacks Joseph must have had going on at this moment. He recognized his brothers, but his brothers didn't recognize him. Now, remember, Joseph was around 17 when his brothers sold him to the Midianites. Surely, he looked more like a man than a boy by this time. He was dressed in Egyptian noble attire. From my understanding, Egyptian men, men had all of their hair shaved and they would have a goatee especially those who were nobles. And he did not speak to them at this point in their native land. He did not speak to his brothers in the language they could understand. Besides all that, his brothers never would have expected their braggadocious little brother, whom they had sold into slavery, to be the, in such a high position in Egypt. Oh, we need to be careful whom we mistreat, step on, and cast off. 
They may, may be the very one who has to help us, who has to be our deliverer at some time in our life, who may be our employer someday. Be careful how you're hateful to that child that just would not line up with what you thought was, was necessary. That may be the child who has to take care of you in your latter years. So now, how should Joseph treat his brothers? What should he say to them? What should he do to them? What should he do for them? <clears throat> he could have said, this is my chance to mess with them. Mm -hmm. I know what they did to me. They deserve anything I do. He could have revealed himself, revealed himself to them and then mess with them. He could have revealed himself and said to them, I know what you did, but now I'm here in this position and I forgive you and just go on. But Joseph chose not to do that. Verse 9 says, And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land you have come. And remember, Joseph had had two dreams. One dream was of 11 sheaves of wheat bowing down to him. The next dream was 11 stars bowing down to him. Each time this representing his brothers bowing down to him and him being in a high position, the brothers wanted no part of this and did not want to see this come to pass. Now at this point, even though Joseph remembered his dreams, he didn't bring them up to the 10 men bowed down before him. As I was thinking on this, I, I was just thinking, all right, the brothers are bowed down. Suppose Joseph had said, there was a time when a young boy had a dream and he shared that dream with his brothers and his brothers were so furious with him but the, and, and then had told, told that dream over again can you imagine those bowed down heads beginning to raise up and look with wonderment and fear? But again, Joseph didn't do that. Joseph told not, he, he did not reveal himself, but rather he tested them. Now, some might say that Joseph was messing with them. But whatever his original intent, his line of accusation and questioning brought forth the information that Joseph wanted. He accused them of being spies. And it would not have been uncommon for an enemy at that time to come into a land as needy men simply, simply to scope out the land and see how they could take advantage of Egypt's store for their own country. Verse 10 and 11. And they said unto him, Nay, my lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's son. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. Every time I read over that line, we are true men, it just catches my attention. <laughs> Sometimes when people say, to be honest with you, yeah. or I'm telling the truth, yeah, you might, might want to listen even more closely. But anyway, the story begins to unfold. Keep in mind, Joseph does not know at this point that the brothers made Jacob believe that he was dead. So Joseph prodded some more. He said unto them in verse 12, verses 12 and 13, Nay, he said unto them, and he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land are you come. I mean, he just kept grinding that point in. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. All oh, the pages turn, another page to, has turned. The brothers have acknowledged their father Jacob and Joseph's youngest brother Benjamin, and they are both alive. And the brother even brothers even acknowledged Joseph. Did they still hate him after all these years? Had they repented in their hearts for what they had done to Joseph? Joseph continues to prod. Verse 14, and Joseph said unto them, That is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Joseph continued in accusation mode. People under stress may make unguarded comments. 
Truly at this point, fear has set in on the brothers. Fear of imprisonment, fear of not being able to get the much needed food to take back home. And their fears are only just beginning. It's a terrible feeling to be accused of something you did not do or something you did not say. And you can't get your accuser to believe you. Anybody ever been there? Sometimes our only defense is the truth. But will the truth bring enough, be enough to bring about victorious love? So Joseph puts an alternative before his brothers. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. Hereby ye shall by the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely lies. It's like Joseph is saying, you say you are true men. Right. Joseph is forcing them to reveal their true hearts, their fears. Their hidden secret. When a person's integrity is in question, if that person cares, they are willing to try to prove themselves. And of all things, now Joseph is asking for Benjamin, Jacob's other favorite son. What would it do to Jacob if he were to lose Benjamin? Surely the brothers are now more feel fearful. Verse 17, and he put them all together in wards, in ward for three days. Surely so much must be going on in the mind and heart of Joseph over these three days. And what must be going on in the hearts and minds of the brothers? We'll find out in just a little bit. Verse 18 said, Says, and Joseph said unto them the third day. This is that verse, that verse with those four special words. Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. These four words, for I fear God, is why I believe Joseph had the will the ability and the power to exercise victorious love. Joseph knew God was with him. Think about it. It seems like everybody that Joseph got around, they knew God was with him. Pharaoh knew God was with Joseph. Many others who had come in contact with Joseph knew God was with him because it seems wherever Joseph was, the favor of God followed. Do you realize that your co-workers could be blessed because of your presence if you are a person who fears and loves the Lord? Your church body could be blessed because you're the person or a person who fears and loves the Lord. God's grace follows his people. And you know, I don't mind the thought of being blessed because of somebody else's walk with the Lord. In that relationship of fellowship with God, Joseph declares, this do and live, for I fear God. In the course of the comments, there are a lot of speculations as to why Joseph did what he did, how, why he questioned them the way he questioned them and interrogated them the way he did. But as we look at those four words in verse 18, we see that his motivation was his fear of reverence for and love of God. So what motivates you? What motivates you to respond the way you do to situations that offend you, situations that hurt you, situations that cause you fear. 
What motivates you? Is it the fear of God, the love of God that motivates you as to how to respond, uh, whether to be vengeful, whether to be angry and, and loud and boisterous? What motivates you when troubled times come your way? One thing to keep in mind, when he said through an interpreter, for I fear God, and remember all of this up until this point, Joseph is speaking in Egyptian. And when he said, by the interpreter, for I fear God, his brothers did not know that he was talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That probably would have been another thing that would have made them look up mm -hmm. and wonder, what does this man, this Egyptian prime minister, know about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And it's possible that it would have even given them some comfort to, to know that this man believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Doesn't it give you some comfort if something's going on, if you find out some of the people around you are also believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm. And you, remember too, the Egyptians had their gods, their gods that they worshiped. So it didn't impress upon the brothers at this time what was being said. Verse 19, verses 19 and 20. If ye be true men, uh. Let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and so shall, and ye shall not die. And they did so. Their lives were being threatened at this point. It wasn't just a matter of imprisonment. Joseph said, ye shall not die. Now, if that won't give you some fear and trembling, I don't know what will. Now, nine of the ten are released to return home, leaving one behind, Simeon, as surety of their return. I would have expected him to have wanted to keep Reuben, Reuben being the oldest, but that was not the case. He took the, the next older brother, Simeon. And even though he had accused them of being spies, look at love showing up. Mm -hmm. He gave them corn or wheat to take home. The brother Simeon and their baby brother was going to be the price for their freedom and their lives. Notice Joseph didn't tell the brothers when they had to come back, just that they had to come back. Apparently it was understood that they must not tarry. And not only did Joseph give them corn to take home, but he also gave their money, and we'll get to that in verse 25. But I just wanted to bring out that love has shown up. Compassion has shown up. Mercy and grace has shown up. I wonder who out there has a situation going on right now that mercy and grace needs to show up. Love needs to show up. We're at verse 20, verses 21, 22, and 23 now. And they are still in Joseph's presence, and they say, and they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul. They saw how fearful was Joseph was when they threw him in the pit and took off his coat and, and left him there and, and then sold him. They heard the cries out of Joseph's. And of course, it's not recorded, but we would imagine he would say, brothers, what are you doing? Don't, don't leave me here. What are you doing? Don't, don't sell me. No, don't do this. He said, when he besought us and we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. In other words, they're saying, God is punishing us for what we did to Joseph. You know, it's something when guilt starts talking to you. When you know you've done the wrong thing, you know you said the wrong thing, and then when things start happening, if we have any sort of conscience, we look back and we see, or we, we look at that situation and we try to discern what is it that has brought this situation on me. And then there's Reuben. Reuben says, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Again, their focus is that God is doing this thing to us. 
And they knew not that Joseph understood him, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. Finally, Joseph hears the remorse coming from the mouths of his brothers. He finally hears remorse coming from his brothers. He finally hears that there is some regret for what they did to him. There is some regret for their hate of him. There's also regret in their fear of God and what God is about to do to them or is doing to them. Joseph was not prepared for what he heard. The brother's words of remorse. Even to hear that personal expression of regret by Reuben. Joseph didn't know that Reuben had tried to protect him. Now, in my opinion, Reuben probably could have done a little bit more mm -hmm. than just said, saying, let's not kill him. <laughs> let's just throw him in the pit. And Reuben had plans to go back and get Joseph, but when he got back, it was, it was too late. Joseph was already gone. Nevertheless, they end up with this situation that they are in now. The expressions of remorse proved to be more than Joseph could handle. Verse 24, and he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. He turned himself from them and wept. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I want to mention here, Joseph is often spoken of by theologians as a type of Christ. In other words, Old Testament Joseph has a lot of qualities that can remind you of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even when I read this verse about Joseph weeping, a strong man weeping, I thought about how Jesus wept mm -hmm. also. He turned himself from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them. I also wonder what Joseph said when he communed with them. Because if you remember earlier, Joseph was talking to them in a strong voice. But now he is communing. That means there is that there is some something more positive going on there. He took from them Simeon and bound them before his eyes. He still want their eyes. He still wanted them to know that he meant business. Now Joseph, a strong man, the second in command in Egypt, is brought to tears. I believe somebody told a lie somewhere along the line. Somebody said, real men don't cry. Uh. Crying is an expression of the soul given by God Almighty. Tears help us to express and even expel strong emotions, especially painful ones. And again, I said, there was an occasion when Jesus wept. I read a quote that said, real men cry all the time, and the older they get, the more they cry, because they don't care what anyone thinks anymore. And there is something about crying that can even speak to the character of a man or woman, because tears also express what you really care about. Verse 25, then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. Before sending his brothers back to Canaan, Joseph took certain calculated steps because it is within his authority to set prices for corn Joseph decided, decided to send the food back with his brothers at no charge. But he refunded at no charge, refunding their money to them without telling them. This strategy served Joseph in two ways. First, he blessed his brothers by not accepting their payment. There's that love showing up. 
thus allowing that money to be used for other purposes as necessary. They had to make the trip back to Egypt. Well, that was all, the trip back to Canaan that was already in the plan. But now they have to come back again. And remember, famine's in the land. So when famine's in the land, things are becoming scarce. So he's also giving them provision to, to go home with and provision to come back with. Second, by not telling them what he was doing, Joseph, Joseph's action, what he was doing by putting the money, their money back into their bags or putting the money into the bags where the, the grain was, Joseph's actions made them fear God, and that will come out more in a later lesson. Because they would wonder, will the governor now see us as spies? What will he do to us, not only as spies, brother, but also as thieves? What will happen to us if we are considered to be liars, thieves, and spies? They knew they were in trouble. Was this finally God's plan to punish them for what they had done to Joseph? How much worse could things get? You know, a guilty conscience can do things to you. <laughs> a guilty conscience can make you suspect of even good things when they happen to you because there's something deep inside of you that says, I don't deserve this, so what's going on? That guilty conscience. So let's get back to the lesson. And that thought, but rather get back to the title, and that thought of victorious love that we began with. And the victorious love is really what we see in verse 25. Then Joseph commanded to fill their, their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way and thus he did unto them. Mercy and grace has truly shown up in verse 25. So let's go back to victorious love. Whether you are on the receiving side or the giving side of victorious love, victorious love is good. Victorious love reminds me of the love of Jesus Christ. Victorious love begins with fearing reverencing, honoring, and loving the Lord God. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we have that ability to operate, to exercise victorious love. So let's, let's speak about victorious love the same as I did from the beginning. And remember, this is whether you're on the giving or the receiving side. Victorious love doesn't come easy. Victorious love tests us. Victorious love humbles us. Victorious love is full of mercy and grace. Victorious love is sacrificial. Victorious love sheds tears. Victorious love forgives. Victorious love restores. Victorious love, love blesses. Victorious love responds in the fear and the wisdom of God. I could not read this, these scriptures under this title of victorious love without thinking about 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 8. That's the New Testament picture of victorious love, where it says to us, charity suffereth long. And I like the word charity there. It represents agapeo, which is that God kind of love, that in spite of love. And let's, let me read that to you. And we're, most of us in the church community, in the Christian community, are familiar with this. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, means it's not boastful, it's not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly, it seeks not her own, it's not easily provoked. Charity thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, 
believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails. So are you a giver of victorious love? Have you ever been the recipient of victorious love? I would venture to say every one of us has. Somebody has loved us when we didn't deserve to be loved the way we were loved. And if it, there was no one else or you think there was no one else, I heard of a man named Jesus Christ right. who while we were yet in our sins, he died for us. Oh, you can know victorious love if you haven't known it. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ wants you to receive that victorious love for him and to know that he will never leave you nor forsake you and that he wants to save you, reconcile you to the Father. And then he wants us to be individuals who exercise, who give victorious love. It's not enough for us just to be recipients of that love, but for us to share it, give it. And remember what I said earlier, victorious love doesn't always come easy. To say you have a victory means that you've had to struggle a little bit. You've had to fight a little bit. You've had to push a little bit. Sometimes you've had to do what's called tough love. Sometimes you've received what's called tough love. I'm just thankful for love. I'm just thankful for the love of God. And I'm thankful that he is able to operate through us so that we can be a blessing to somebody else in this world that we live in. And the way things are going right now, this world needs a whole lot of love. Most of all, needing the love of God and to know what it is to have the fear of God. Can we pray together? Holy Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, we want to take your word and mix it with faith so that it can have power in our lives. We read, Lord, about Joseph who had victorious love. The tapestry of his life oftentimes must have made him wonder, why is this happening to me? We have situations, Lord God, where it seems like sometimes it's First one thing and then another. And we just don't understand why we're going through what we're going through. But Lord, we choose to believe because we love you that all things are working together for good because we love you and because we are the called according to your purpose. We might not see it right now, but Lord, help us to have the patience, the perseverance to continue to walk in faith and help us to have that fear of God that help us to do the right thing in spite of wrong things or hard things coming our way. Lord, help us to live with this victorious love that you have deposited into each one of your children. That love that is full of compassion, that love that forgives, that love that restores, that love that endures. Oh, Father God, by your grace and mercy, your word tells us that others will know that we, that we are your disciples, the Lord Jesus Christ's disciples, because of the love that we show to the brethren. Father, help us to have that light of love. You told us to let our light so shine before men. Lord, let the light that people see be the light of love that you've given us, the light of love in our marriages, light of love in, at, with our children, light of love with co-workers and bosses, light of love, Lord God, even as we think about the political realm. Oh God, we need your grace and your mercy. So many, Lord, are suffering through things associated with corona, whether it be job losses or, or sickness or simply fear and depression. Oh God, we are so glad that you are great and you are greatly to be praised and that you are the most high God. And because of who you are, Lord God, we choose to put our trust in you. Again, let the fear of God, the reverence, the holy reverence of God, order our steps. Be the motivation of our hearts and our minds so that our intents will be pure and that we will get the God result at the end of our 
life's journey. And not only at the end of life's journey, but in every situation that we walk through, that we can get the God result because we have trusted in the Most High God. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We thank you for joining us for the Sunday School Hour. Remain with us for the uh, preaching time by Reverend Anthony Tinsley this morning. He's coming with a word from the Lord, and we look forward to that time with him this morning. Grace and peace to each one of you. God bless you.